Bransfield. Sometimes you just want to play some SNES games, but you can't think of a justification for doing it. So you come up with a video idea, and it's a bit of a niche one, and you think, maybe I shouldn't do that if I want to be as popular as the cool popular YouTube kids. But then you realise you've committed your brain to it, so that is what you're going to do. So here we go. The movie games for the SNES ranked worst to first. What's the science behind this study? Well, basically I played every single game on this list. All the footage I captured is of me playing them. Sometimes I cheated, sometimes I didn't, but I did play them all. And then what I did with each game was I stopped playing as soon as I couldn't be asked anymore. And then I ranked them. And I debated how much people care about anything ranked between numbers 60 and 15. But it is inarguable science, let's be honest. The result is a list of 66 games. I might not have them all, I am painfully aware of this. I didn't even have Waterworld on the list initially, as it was a Europe-only release and my source list was US-only games. I did have The Untouchables in here, then realised the SNES game is based on a TV show and not a movie. And yes, I may have missed one or more Japan-only games. Please send your lawyers to the usual address with your complaints. That out the way, the incredibly long-winded task of... RANKING! Based on an animated movie that came out of a stand-up comedy routine, Bebe's Kids is absolutely the worst movie game on SNES and arguably the worst game on the console full stop. It's boring, runs badly, plays utterly stupidly and will make you want to do something more fun with your time like, say, rub a cheese grater over your eyeballs before dousing them in a lemon juice bath. An actual wow moment for anyone who plays it, I'm sure, and the poster child for why movie games have such a bad reputation. If Bebe's Kids didn't exist, Last Action Hero would be the worst game by far. An absolute joke. Genuinely one of the worst things you could ever play, verging on the actual dictionary definition of literally unplayable. And it's extra irritating owing to the fact the film it's based on, while nowhere near a great film, did at least toy with the tropes of its genre and settings. The game backing it up could have done the same, but instead... I, I don't even know what it tried to do. Now obviously this dog-based platformer is absolutely awful and has nothing about it that would make you ever want to sit down and actively play it, unless you're lacking sense like I am and sit down to play all these games. But Beethoven 2 Beethoven can't be last on the list because you get to carry puppies in your mouth, so game of the year? It's fair to say there's a bit more to this one than you might expect, with a hint of Arnie-based exploration and investigation thrown into the mix alongside some navigational motorbike-based levels to break up the action. There's a bit more to it than just a run-and-gunner or a basic platformer. Problem is, Terminator 2 Judgment Day is one of the worst things I've ever played. It plays like your controller's been encased in epoxy resin and has all the inherent charm of an STI. A classically awful movie tie-in, backing up one of the all-time greats of cinema. Did you know Wayne's World is the only Saturday Night Live spin-off movie apart from the Blues Brothers to gross over a hundred million dollars? And that it was Mike Myers' film debut? And that Myers made sure the first film's director, Penelope Spheris, didn't return to head up the sequel. And that I'm just picking out trivia bits from the first film's IMDb page because this is one of the absolute worst pieces of crap games I've ever played. Yeah. Wow. I feel genuinely sorry for the schmucks who were forced to make this by the suits at THQ. There's ambition in Frankenstein, and an attempt to, I don't know, scope? The developers clearly wanted to make a game of adventure, of exploration, of moody atmosphere. You can see it in the bones and bolts of the thing. Unfortunately, what they ended up with was a stuttering mess of bad design pieced together in an unholy union which should never have seen the light of day. Which, as you may have predicted, is pretty fitting for the source material. The Wizard of Oz's demo footage, the thing that plays when you don't press anything on the title screen, is either a recording of someone who doesn't know how to play the game, 
or it's so badly coded the AI controlling the characters for the demo doesn't know how to play the game. It's absolutely... wonderful? Anyway, I'd recommend letting the Oz demos play and nothing else, because if you pick up a controller and play this game, you will want to go somewhere over the rainbow, and by somewhere over the rainbow, I mean to stand in busy traffic. One thing Dracula has going for it, wait, two things, first one being technically you're playing as Kinu, but the other thing Dracula has going for it is the developers were going for a defined, clear outcome here. It would have the name of the film on it and it would be a take on the classic Castlevania series. The thing the game does not have going for it is that it is absolutely laughable. A prime example of wanting to emulate something but having absolutely no idea of the craft involved in doing it. Not even John Wick himself can save it, especially be because it's, it's not John Wick at all. Come on now, by no means do I think Time Cop was an all-time classic, but it was enjoyable 90s sci-fi schlock with Jean-Claude Van Damme doing the splits in the kitchen and roundhouse kicks and the same matter not occupying the same space at the same time. It wasn't great, but it deserved something better than this. Time Cop the game is, as was the style at the time, digitised nonsense. With the digitised nonsense comes stiff, unresponsive animations, clumsy control, samey enemies, and a general sense that this was made over a lazy weekend rather than with any real effort put into it. And did the developers even watch the film? It's got a bit where you're in a submarine being attacked by octopuses. Time Cop is absolutely one of the worst movie games ever to come to snares, and because it was an exclusive on the platform, it's something Nintendo fans can hold dear in their hearts. Nobody else got to experience the pure badness on show. It's a complete joke of a scrolling beat-em-up, though not quite on the sheer badness level of Bebe's kids. I didn't get to the end of Cliffhanger though, so I have no idea if you get to engage in a fistfight with John Lithgow. That would likely save the whole thing, just like how battering the Pope in Assassin's Creed 2 made it the greatest game of all time. Ah well. There'll be a pattern emerging in this list as we go through it, and that pattern is, hey guess what, it's a garbage platformer with nothing much in the way of redeeming qualities. Dennis the Menace, simply titled Dennis over here, as we already have a menace in comic book form, does nothing of note uh, apart from being bad. Next! A Home Alone game. So, set up a house with traps, let the burglars come in, see the mayhem ensue. Like a top-down real-time strategy game aimed at kids, with a focus on inflicting massive foot-based damage via strewn around caltrop slash bits of Lego under windows. Just do something like that, surely? Apparently no. Apparently this is the approach. A really big pile of crap that made Macaulay Culkin sad. It's sort of got Tim Curry in it, I guess, which makes Home Alone 2 just edge out the original film's game here. Other than that, this is a confusing mix of rubbish and crap, like a turd and a bath smoothie as I heard on TV recently. Why, yes, I do watch Ted Lasso. I actually re-watched No Escape not too long ago as I write this script and enjoyed it thoroughly. More 90s sci-fi schlock with a fine performance by Ray Liotta and the ever-reliable Lance Henriksen. Watch it alongside Escape from New York and Fortress and you've got yourself an evening of tough dudes escaping from dystopian prisons of varying design, which is top-notch in my eyes. The game? Well, it was made by the same studio behind the Frankenstein tie-in and it's absolutely horrible, as you can see. Culkin's third appearance on this list, and hey, it's a garbage platformer. Who knew this would have happened? The Page Master is like Disney's Fantasia on Mega Drive, but through a lens that warps it into one of the worst things you've ever played. This one falls in a bit of a sub-list in these overall rankings, in that Outlander is one of a few games here that isn't technically based on a film. 
No, this is a game that was originally a Mad Max tie-in, and even without knowing that, I'm sure a lot of you had picked up on those vibes. Mindscape literally made the whole game with the name The Road Warrior, then lost the license, so had to go through and remove any direct references to Max and his post-apocalyptic friends. Frankly, it's better to talk about the history and curio value of the game, you see, because it's horrible to play. You're driving, you run out of fuel, you stop and do a god-awful platformerish section, you get back in the car, and you go again. That's it. Just play the 2015 game that actually got to keep Max's name in it. I had some brief hope for this one, given Robocop 3 on the Amiga was a weird 3D FPS alike that was at the very least a good effort, if not exactly a superb title. The SNES version, though, is merely a do-over of the original Robocop arcade game, side-scrolling run and gun, or plod and blast, but minus a lot of the fun of that original game, and with the addition of some truly awful jetpack levels. That said, Robocop 3 The SNES Game is still 300 times better than the movie it's based on, and rather interestingly, it came out a year before the film itself. Taking the high-octane action of Contra and transposing it to the future war against the machines and the 80s war against a lone robotic assassin makes sense on paper. Switch out the sprites and backgrounds and you're onto a winner, even if Konami would sue you. But being sued would be preferable to this awful impression of Contra with a Terminator skin on it. The Mega Drive Terminator tie-in is lauded as the superior movie game, and after playing the SNES version, I can absolutely see why. It took a few tries for me to get the hang of the first few stages on the Rocketeer, but the moment I realised I should be paying attention to the tiny screen at the bottom and not the big screen at the top, it all clicked which is very strange. And when it did click, it helped the Rocketeer show its whole arse to the world. Boring, then suddenly way too difficult, then turned off before I got to the apparent hand-to-hand -hand combat sections in the game. A game that absolutely should have a rocket strapped to its back before being aimed directly at the sun. Oddly, Waterworld was only released in Europe. That's the game, not the film, that really isn't as good as its reputational rehabilitation by some I've seen online would have you think. But why? Why would a tie-in for such a massive global hype feast not arrive in its home country? No idea. Can't be because it was terrible, given how many other worse games did come out. Anyway, Waterworld on SNES gets lost in the noise somewhat thanks to its non-US release, while the Virtual Boy version, a US exclusive, gets all the ire of the internet thrust its way as one of the worst games ever made, and so on and so forth. Let's be hilariously angry about bad old games for the views. Waterworld on SNES, though, it's not good, no. It's pretty bad, actually. But it's really not the worst thing out there, and it does at least play pretty well with the ideas it snatches from the terrible film. I'd even say there's potential in the boat bits, though instead they're turned into either kill em all borathons or defender alike rescue the civilians bits. The side-scrolling action and swimming bits, though, they play and look like bad Amiga games on the SNES in 1995. No, thank you. I craved this game as a child. I lusted after it. I wanted it in my life. It mixed the Batman of the mid-90s with Mortal Kombat. Magazines I read at the time said it was good. It looked like real life, but you could play it. Years passed, my desires unfulfilled, and then it happened. I picked up the pad, I played the game. And I wanted to slap the child version of me upside the head for being such a goof. A garbage Mortal Kombat wannabe. Batman Forever is such a weird, very much of its time thing, and a very bad thing at that. Look, I've got no idea. I tried cheating to help me figure out what the hell was going on in toys, but I just couldn't do anything of note, so I gave up. Hence, it's awful. A versatile and finely becoated and bemulleted magic man makes his way through a garden, shooting spells at a dog in this action platformer that came out in 1995, named after Warlock, a film that came out in 1989, but also the game is based more on the film's sequel thematically, so... yeah. 
Nobody cared about the film, nobody cared about the game. It's not the worst thing in the world and there's some fun to be had with the array of spells on offer, plus there's a decent atmosphere to it all, but nah, no good. This Gina Davis cinematic flop is shallow and quickly leads to boredom, and it features some supremely frustrating race-slash-obstacle sections which are pretty much the worst thing ever. One hit and back to the beginning of the level and lose a life, go fudge yourself. But there is a definite charm to Cutthroat Island. It's well animated and the combat system expands as you progress, so there is fun to be had if you're willing to accept that in all honesty, it's not a good game and you will have to play through some awful, truly awful minecart sequences that absolutely demand you use an unlimited lives cheat. What initially looks decent and is a fitting genre for a film that is just a series of fights in a very video gamey fashion, Dragon the Bruce Lee story is let down hugely by the fact its fighting system is just bad. It's one of those where the AI reads every input you make, and the only way to consistently beat opponents isn't to learn systems and adapt and react on the fly, it's to learn the cheese moves and spam your way to an earned victory. The way in which the game mixes themes and settings from the movie into what you're doing is well done, even if you can just jump over the ice blocks instead of smashing them like Jason Scott Lee did with such delightful aplomb in the film version, but Dragon is just not a particularly good game. And that honestly surprised me having never played it before making this video, as the game got high scores in a fair few UK games mags back in the day. Hmm. It definitely looks the part, with nicely detailed sprite work and characterful animation, even if it's not recognisably John Goodman you're playing as, but The Flintstones is one of many utterly dull, badly designed platformers on this list. The fact that Chuck Rock exists and was already out on SNES before the Flintstones hit means I can't even say it's the best Stone Age platformer on the system. You get to bounce children off the top of your car though, so it definitely deserves 41st slot here. Lethal Weapon gives off Rick Dangerous vibes to me for some reason, and I do think I'd have less fun with the game if I'd been playing it with cheats turned off, bless you mister and your built-in cheats, but ultimately Lethal Weapon is just another garbage platformer. Conceptually it earns some points by virtue of the fact it's really funny to play as Danny Glover though. The first game based on a Disney animated film and it doesn't rank anywhere near as high as the numerous other entries on this list. Why? Well, because Beauty and the Beast is a straight up garbage platformer, which isn't much of a surprise, with the actual surprise thrown in that it's oddly difficult, especially given it's made for literal children. I mean, factor in that the difficulty mainly comes from awful design elements, hyper-aggressive enemies, poor platforming controls, a useless attack from the beast, and you get your reasons why it's so hard. A shocker for the Disney animated clan of games, frankly. Go, go, flower arrangers, as the classic line says. Fitting, as this was developed by Harvest Moon creators Natsume. Anywho, the Power Rangers movie tie-in does nothing special and nothing fancy, but the simplistic, basic stuff it does do is… not the worst. A scrolling beat-em-up, it does boil things down to almost the simplest it could ever be, left and right, though with two lanes to walk in and one attack button. You fight enemies who change colour as they get harder, you fight bosses who need patterns learning, you snowboard, it's absolutely basic. It's not very good. This Power Rangers game also doesn't have any big monster fights, which is genuinely stupid given it's a Power Rangers game. At the same time, had I been given this as an eight-year-old, well, I'd wonder how time travel had been invented first, but second, I'd think, yeah, I mean, it's all right for the kids for 20 minutes. Absolutely no more than that, though. Basing a game on what was at one point an R-rated adult animated film from Ralph Bakshi was always going to be an odd choice, but hey, Cool World ended up a PG-13 with Bakshi shafted by the production studio, so there you go, perfect SNES exclusive fodder. 
Some people seem to think the Cool World game is actually okay, and I can see why. It's at the very least creative, blending platforming with a point-and-click adventure game style, but it's a confused, confusing experience and a huge slog to play through, especially those car bits. But as with so many others on this list, there is a novelty value in who you're sort of technically playing as. In this case, Gabriel Byrne. I mean, it's an adventure game in Japanese based on the Disney version of Alice in Wonderland. I don't know what opinion to have on this, to be honest. I played a mini game for a bit and threw some pies at a cat. Then I painted Alice entirely grey to signify her plummet into serious mental health issues once she emerged from Wonderland and back into reality. I'll just put it somewhere in the middle, to be fair, okay? This release was actually cancelled after the game was finished, or at least very close to being finished, and frankly it's a travesty. Not because it's a good game, though by no means is it anything near as bad as some of the dross I had to play to make this video. It's a perfectly mediocre scrolling beat-em-up, like a pound shop version of Capcom's The Punisher. No, the cancellation of the Shadows game tie-in is a travesty because how many games let you play as a character portrayed by Alec Baldwin? Without this joy, we truly have not lived even if it is a 5 out of 10 game at best. Another bit of a miss on the Disney animated film platform game tie-in front. Pinocchio arrived late in the SNES's lifespan and did a great big pile of nothing much for the concept of movie games. Would you believe it, the game based on the film about the boy made of wood, stop laughing, is a platformer. It's well animated, characterful and thematically sound, but my word is it dull. Yes, it's made for kids and that fact does a lot of heavy lifting to keep this one out of the real doldrums, well, that and the fact it actually works as a game, a novelty in this video, but the Pinocchio game that came out 56 years after the Pinocchio film… ain't a particularly good one. This is a weird one, because if The Hunt for Red October didn't have the movie license attached to it, there'd be a decent chance of making a half-decent game here. An arcadey submarine-based blaster, probably called something like In The Hunt and released in 1993, and… well, no, sorry, that, that actually exists and is great. Plus, saying The Hunt for Red October could be a half-decent game without the constraints of its license also assumes the developers would get more time to make it and would have more skill in making games and… I'm just making excuses for something that doesn't exist. It isn't a good game, and I don't really count it as something you get to play as Alec Baldwin in, sadly. The thing that helps Demolition Man stand above much of the filmic game crowd is in how much effort the developers clearly put in to make this a cinematic, atmospheric experience that, while not recreating the plot beat for beat, made a very early slash mid-90s console video game version of the film it was based on. I have no idea why those top-down sections exist, but what can you do? The gunplay platforming sections are just a few short steps away from being pretty good, and the frame rate is just a few enemies not being on screen short of running way too fast, almost as if it was developed with its inherent slowdown in mind. But yeah, Demolition Man is something you might actually show off to friends back in the day, but not actually let them play. It can be decent, it's definitely not great. I didn't know this existed until about 90% of the way through making this list, given it received a Japan-only release and really wasn't the sort of film I'd expect to get a game version on SNES some four years after the film came out, and three years after the games based on that film first came out, including a terrible one on the Amiga I played loads because I was seven and so had no taste. Anyway, Super Back to the Future Part 2 is a pleasant surprise. It somehow manages to simultaneously be nothing like the film while also nailing it, in a very Japanese video gamey way. Why, yes, it is a platformer, and I'd actually say in a strange way it's a vague clone of Sonic. Marty on his hoverboard, generally speaking, just goes right quickly. There are spring pads to launch you about, multiple routes on levels all leading to the same goal, and if you jump, you're constantly doing a spin attack. See what I mean? And, just like Sonic, I don't actually like it that much. Blamo. Oh. 
an absolutely fabulous example of the most basic, boring, pointless of movie tie-ins. Is We're Back a Dinosaur's story really bad? No. Is it just lacking in many aspects that make up a game you consider good fun and would bother ever turning on again? Absolutely. It looks alright, or at least the main Rex sprite does, but this is a clunky and boring game with zero creative flourish about it. And, hilariously, it was made by WWE 2K development studio Visual Concepts. On the higher end of the not great scale, Stargate is still rough around many an edge and way too hard for its own good, in that classic 90s game way. It follows the plot of the film well enough and you get to be Kurt Russell, a personal life goal unlocked even if he is a gun nut in reality. The game's meaty in content, there's a lot of mixed objectives to get stuck into along the way and it's… yeah, alright at times. Plus, it looks lovely in the most part. But I do feel Stargate just doesn't hit things in quite the way it needs to. Imprecise controls, combat without any real impact, exploration that ends up boring and frustrating, and as a result the game suffers a fair old slip down the rankings. I don't know what the Lawnmower Man is trying to be, but if you compare it to Contra, you're not too far off, and just like anything else on this list compared to Contra, it's not actually like Contra. Not really. It's just run and gun. But saying it's like Contra is a quick and easy way of describing what a game's going for, even if you then spend multiple extra seconds following up that brief quick and dirty description with more in-depth disclaimers as to why it's not actually like Contra. Huh. Anyway, the Lawnmower Man isn't the worst thing in the world, and the first-person 3D bits between levels, while awful, are a fun addition from a thematic perspective. But the game makes no sense, and while it can be decent fun, it never strays fully into actually good territory. Having said that, it does feature shooting at helicopters and vans and dogs and monkeys, as well as collecting CDs, meaning it is significantly better than the film. I learned while making this video there was a non-Disney-made sequel to the Snow White fairy tale with the animated film featuring the voice talents of folks like Malcolm McDowell and Jar Jar Gabor. I like this fact even if I'll never bother with the film. And the game? Well, it's 27th in a list of 66 titles, which has to be even more shocking than the existence of the film sequel. It's nowhere near as bad as you might think for a movie game platformer. Snow White controls snappily, there are various routes in which to tackle levels, it rewards you for exploring, and it absolutely nails the twee bullshittery of the source material. No, it's not up there with the best platformers on the SNES or in this list. If anything, I'd compare it in quality to the Amiga platformers of the era. But it's a surprise highlight, no doubt. A low-level, I'll probably never play it again highlight, but a highlight nonetheless. This one is arguably not based directly on any specific film, instead Super Godzilla is more just based on Godzilla in general. But it is absolutely based on the GCU, so I'm allowing it to fit in here. So Super Godzilla is a strange and, dare I say it, creative take on what would otherwise have been either a straightforward one-on-one -on -one fighting game or a garbage platformer. The thought of Godzi somersaulting away from crumbling floor tiles collecting flower petals in a cartoonly coloured take on Tokyo. Well. You can picture it, can't you? But no, Super Godzilla is a slow-paced and fairly obtuse blend of light real-time strategy as you navigate the big lizard bastard around cities trying to find invading monster gits, and a timing and tapping based fighting game that, yes, did take me longer than I'm comfortable admitting to figure out. There's effort on show, there's creative thinking at play, and while it doesn't pay off in what you could call a really good game, it certainly stands out from the crowd. The US release of Casper is peculiar and not very good, but we don't want to talk about turning the friendly ghost into a net who catches books. No, the Japanese version is the one of interest here, a totally different game from a different developer. I might not have been able to understand what was going on while playing, but it felt like a much better time than on the Western release. An isometric explorer and puzzler with a bit of spooking thrown in for good measure, I can't hand on heart say Casper Japan is a great game predominantly as I've no idea what's going on in it. But it's significantly better than the US version and it definitely has something going for it. Thinking about it, this one maybe should have come earlier in the pecking order, but 
As I said, who actually cares about the things between 60 and 15? basic port of something that's fun in the arcades but not that great in the home, T2 the arcade game is lifted in fun quality significantly if you play it with a super scope. Nobody has those anymore, nobody bloody had them to begin with, so you're stuck with either a controller or a SNES mouse to play the thing. And given few have the mouse… yeah. Maybe this one's position is based more on my enduring love both for the film and for this game, which I owned on the Amiga back in the day, where mouse controller standard was a thing, so my fondness transcends platforms and decades. It is good fun, I'm not being completely off with my positioning of it at 24, but playing an on-rails arcade shooting gallery game like T2 the arcade game with a controller is just a bit of an unfun time. But I still like the game, so that's that, I suppose. The Gomez fronted tie-in to the early 90s movie retains a positive reputation these days, fondly remembered in some circles as a fantastic example of a movie walloped into the world of gaming and significantly better than most of the other movie game garbage platformers. It's not an entirely wrong assertion, as there's a good deal of fun to be had in the Addams Family, but there are more restrictions of that fun and limitations of the good times that pop up after not too long to make it something not quite deserving of its positive reputation. Gomez's adventure is fun for a short time, but ultimately leaves you craving something with a bit more substance to it. How to introduce another garbage platformer? Huh. By saying, here's another garbage platformer? Could work, I guess. So yeah, okay, I had seen Three Ninjas Kickback at the top of my list of definitely legally owned games for years now and never bothered playing it, fully expecting it to be, indeed, a garbage platformer. And I wouldn't say I was exactly blown away with what was presented when I slapped it on and gave it a play for the first time ever, and yet, and yet, there's not infinite fun to be had, there's a lot of problems to highlight, but I do genuinely think Three Ninjas Kickback is on the top part of the garbage platformer pile. You can actually have some fun with it, which is tantamount to a miracle. It doesn't quite stick the landing. There's too much about Jurassic Park's SNES game that's loose and underexplained. Parts of it don't control very well at all. It's seriously unfair in that early to mid 90s video game way, and a complete lack of save system, there aren't even passwords, make it a trudge in the extreme. So why do I still like it? I can't say JP is a good game specifically, because it's not, but this SNES incarnation is up there with the best of the games released on the original Jurassic Park. I hear the cries of Mega Drive fans everywhere right now, and it's definitely more fun than the plodding puzzle-based Dolathon on the Amiga. This version mixes shooter mechanics with exploration, light puzzle solving, and even throws in regular forays into a Duma-like first-person mode when exploring inside buildings. That's the bit that doesn't control very well at all, by the way. So no, it's not amazing, but Jurassic Park is more ambitious than you might expect, and as long as you're either cheating or playing with a guide, it can pass a few hours. Just remember not to turn it off or you'll lose all your progress. I'm not even going to say this is a garbage platformer. Nope, Dino City is a platformer. And if that twist isn't enough, it's got another twist to twist into the twist, it's tied into a film hardly anybody knows, and even after playing the game you'd be none the wiser that it's based on something called Adventures in Dinosaur City. Utterly bizarre. Still, Dino City is a half-decent game. It's genuinely smart in its design at times, it gets you thinking, it involves some skillful dinosaur switch to the human rider mechanics to solve puzzles, and when you've got infinite lives on to counteract the extremely high difficulty level, you can have a good time here. It's not particularly special, but it's a decent enough distraction, I'd say. That said, Dino City is a platformer that exists in a world, it exists on a console, where Super Mario World and Yoshi's Island live. And if you're gonna come for the crown of the humans riding dinosaurs in a colourful platformer thing, well, you better not miss. Dino City does miss. Factor 5's take on Indy's adventures sadly didn't include the best film where that 
guy swings on ropes as a monkey or whatever, but it did include the other best films apart from Temple of Doom, which is included but isn't a best film. Anyway. Indie's Greatest Adventures is a stylish platformer full of decent but not quite there ideas. Releasing years after The Last Crusade, it was in the fortunate position of not having to be rushed and launched around the same time as any movie, and I do think that shows. There's a level of polish here you don't get with most day and date movie games, including some Indiana Jones games, actually. Indie's Adventures is a decent action-y platformery whippy game and worth a play, even if it doesn't do much of note with the formula. But the presentation, the animation, the music, it all elevates the experience to something a bit better than the sum of its creaky parts. You got me, this one is another not actually based on a film. Jurassic Park 2 The Chaos Continues was a game sequel that came out about three years before the Goldblum starring film sequel, so really probably shouldn't be on this list if you want to be all technical and accurate. But then a Jurassic Park 2 film did come out, and it is my list, and I did like this game when I was younger, and according to the manual you are playing as Sam Neill's Alan Grant, so I'm going to accept it. The Chaos Continues is another run and gunner, another idea derived from the maestro that is Contra, and it's definitely one of the more successful ones on the list. Mixing lethal and non-lethal weaponry, punishment for using said lethal weaponry on too many dinosaurs, which almost makes up for Alan Grant wielding a machine gun, and a non-linear approach to how you tackle the various missions on offer. I absolutely loved it as a kid. It was such a hilarious step up from the slow-paced plot of the first Jurassic Park game. These days? It's still good fun, sure, but you can absolutely see the cracks in the general construction. And it's yet another one you really need to bang on an Infinite Lives cheat to have any real fun. Well, unless you have time and patience and are capable of learning, I guess. I do not, and I cannot. A number of SNES and Mega Drive games still see a schism in the games playing public owing to the different versions of a single game available on each format. But the same wasn't, um, the same when it came to the console versions of The Lion King. So what we had here was a straight up platformer, whether you played on Nintendo or Sega's machine, and a decent one at that. It's a game that's way too hard. Anyone seeing footage of my failed attempts to conquer the second level, I apologise if your PTSD flares up. It's a game that had me saying things like, yeah, thanks you little lion prick at the screen more times than I'm comfortable with. But it's a game that is good looking and well presented and outside of the purposely designed levels to make you want to smash your controller simply so you couldn't beat the game in the short period you rented it from Blockbuster, it was a fun enough platformer. Not great, but fun enough. It's 900 times better than most titles on this list, but not the best movie game in the SNES's history, basically. So yes, The Lion King is still just waiting to be king. Bit of a specific reference there to show I'm not just writing boilerplate nonsense in this script as so bloody many of them are platformers and are hard to unequivocally recommend. I may hurt feelings when I say this, but I see Batman Returns as similar to the Lord of the Rings Return of the King game for the PS2, Xbox and GameCube. It's a perfectly fine beat-em-up and you can have fun with it, and if you played it as a kid, which you probably did because it was a non-terrible game based on a popular film of the era, well, you'll have had fun. And you'll remember it as fun. Even though it's not an amazing game and it really does nothing particularly interesting with the format. That's Batman Returns of the King in a nutshell. Anyway, Batman Returns is good fun and rightly has a good reputation in filmy games and in Batman-y games. It's no Streets of Rage or Final Fight, sure, but it has enough Konami flair and know-how about it to make sure it's enjoyable to play through in the most part. Unfair difficulty spikes in a general shallowness, as you may have predicted if you've been paying attention to plenty of other games in this ranking, hold bats back from the tippy-top echelons, but it's definitely a movie game worth a go, so long as your expectations are suitably adjusted. Just don't play Streets of Rage 4 right before you play this, okay? This one hurts. A bit, not a lot. Judge Dredd makes for a fantastic game at first. It's a run-and-gun platformer, and so sure, it's not exactly mind-blowing in its creativity, but the game mixes in a couple of elements that are difference-makers. 
First, it's objective-based, with primary and secondary goals to achieve on each level, meaning there's an element of focus to what you're doing beyond just blasting criminal scum in the face, and there's a smaller element of choice when it comes to choosing to complete the secondary objectives or not. Second, your run and gunning is actually tempered somewhat in that you're able to actually arrest some enemies after besting them in combat rather than just blowing them all away. I really do love me some thematic touches. The problem is, while Judge Dredd starts out promisingly, you soon realise the game doesn't really develop any other ideas. You're wandering around hunting down contraband to destroy and perps to shoot into submission pretty much from level 1 through to the last level. Though, admittedly, it does go off the deep end towards the end. It's a fabulous looking game, mind you, and it's significantly, significantly better than the Stallone film it's based on. Nowhere near as good as Carl Urban's Dread, though, obviously. Hey, wouldn't you know it, it's another of the handful of games in this list that isn't really specifically tied to a film per se. Tell you what, if you don't like the few games included in this micro-category, I've got a wild way in which you can cope. Just ignore them. Anyway, Mickey Mania is based on a few of the Mouse's outings over the years, and given Steamboat Willie and The Prince and the Pauper are referred to as films on Wikipedia, I'm allowing it. Mickey Mania is by no means the best outing for the Micker in the gaming world, and a fair old bit of the fun seems to be hamstrung by the project operating a style-over-substance approach to things. But hey, what style? It's gorgeous, wonderfully evocative of the source material in a way that conjures thoughts of Cuphead, and, while I was a wee bit negative mere seconds ago, it is a pretty good game. And that's why it makes it into the top 15. Just makes sense, you know? I am, it's fair to admit, very glad to be out of the realm of the garbage platformers and well into the pile of decent to good and, at the very least, playable platformers. Hook is buried somewhere in that pile for sure. It's a game that links well to the themes of the film it's based on, rather than recreating all the silver screen versions events beat for beat, it's an amalgam of ideas and extrapolations from the movie's storyline and setting. And it works better for it, definitely. Being able to fly freely through levels, as long as your flight meter holds out at least, is wonderfully liberating, conjuring that magical feeling that you're doing something you shouldn't be doing that you might be breaking the game, even if it's a clearly signposted ability for you to take advantage of. And the platforming in action works well. It's snappy and responsive in a way I never expected it to be, and it's just, generally speaking, not a chore to play through. Am I saying Hook is a good game? I think I am, yes. It's not amazing. It's not the best platform in the world, but in the company we're keeping in this list of all lists, it's not embarrassingly far off of greatness, frankly. It is the pan. First up, I wanted to love the Super Star Wars series as a kid so much. But really all I ended up doing in life was A, owning Super Empire Strikes Back, and B, trying to get to the snow speeder level so I could take out some atats. No, it's not at, -AT don't be absurd. So I don't have the ingrained fondness for the series that many console gamers my age do. That said, Super Star Wars, the single first game in the series, is clearly in the upper echelons of movie games on snares, thanks in no small part to the phenomenal production values at play. It looks fantastic, it's wonderfully animated, and the music and sound effects key to anything Star Wars are spot on. So what if the game itself is a samey, easy, but then suddenly massively unfair run and gun game with the odd mode seven stage thrown in? It doesn't matter because it's Star Wars in super form. And pretty much exactly the same can be said for the Empire Strikes Back follow-up, because it really is practically the same game again with some small upgrades, mostly seen in the Mode 7 stages which run a bit smoother, force powers to dick about with, different enemies, etc, and so on. But the big change from the first game to Empire is just how ridiculously hard this one is. Like, actually bewilderingly unfairly hard. Hard to the point you just throw down the controller and go to do something more fun with your life, like... Mm, I've already done the grated eyes bit. Hmm. Like, intentionally stubbing your toe 16 times a day for a month solid. That'll do. Okay, so Empire is still a good game and one people are fond of, but come on, how did people ever finish this game without cheats? Ah, well, at least it lets you take out Atats with the cable trick. That's still blissful to this day, even if it isn't quite as pretty as my brain remembered it looking.
And guess what? Pretty much exactly the same, again, can be said for the Return of the Jedi third entry to the Super Star Wars trilogy. Yes, it's practically the same game again again, with different levels and Mode 7 stages covering the events of a film that features wholesale slaughter of teddy bear people. No, that didn't scar me as a child. I don't think. Probably. What's the game like? Again, it's a platformer. You have characters to choose from, you'll be double jumping most of the time, Chewbacca does a spinning clothesline, and even though this one is considered the easy entry to the series, it's still way too hard in a genuinely irritating way. I tried so many times to make any progress on one of the Ewok stages and just… yeah. Super Jedi is not as good as its reputation might have you believe, but it's still good. At times, and mainly with cheats switched on. Exactly like the other two then. If I were to put these three in a defined order, I'd go worst to best, Empire, Jedi, Star Wars. Yeah, that'll do. First one felt fresh at the time, it became stale as it went on, but Jedi just had a bit more zhuzh than Empire. Maybe because I didn't spend way too much of my youth failing at Jedi, given I didn't own it. Let's revert to what I said about Alien 3 on SNES in a previous video I made about the various versions of the film tie-in. While you were indeed galloping about and blasting the acid-soaked freaks with abandon, there was a level of depth to the SNES game not found elsewhere. In fact, there was a hint of Metroidvania about the whole thing, with a large, sprawling complex of interconnected rooms requiring you navigate back and forth through them to complete a metric crapload of different missions. Not just rescuing prisoners, but repairing pipes, fixing computers, and just blasting more of HR Giga's finest walking penises. I grew up on the Amiga game, the near-perfect port of the Mega Drive version, so that was my introduction to the Alien 3 games, and my favourite for a long time. Until I really put time into the SNES version. Nintendo's game, eventually, became my firm favourite. Again, it's not going to be in the all-time top 10s on the format, but when it comes to movie games, it's one of the very best. Which is why it's in the top 10 here then. Bizarre. I've definitely run out of ways to say, hey look, it's another platformer, so hey look, it's another platformer. Based on the film sequel that I never actually saw, I only know of the first film and some streets paved with cheese, but this was the one where Fivel was a cowboy or something. I've gathered that from this game in which Fivel is a cowboy and his enemies are generally cat outlaws. There's a lot to be said for how dull Fivel Goes West is at times and how thoroughly repetitive it gets after not really very long, but the simple fact is I just enjoyed An American Tale. I had fun with it, and I actually ended up playing it for a while. It tapped into something. It's a solidly made platformer. Its mechanics are just different enough from everything else that it's at least initially interesting, and it looks fantastic. A well-deserved eighth place, I'd say. I soften more to it every time I play it, and likely as I get older, but the comparison between the console versions of Aladdin always remains. And I do still prefer the Mega Drive version. It's more of an ever so slightly different experience than on SNES, in which Capcom's game is a more straightforward jump on their heads flavour of platformer. But here Aladdin is, standing proud at number 7 in this list of 300,000 awful games and a few good ones. So yes, the fact may be my heart is with the Mega Drive game, but my head tends to interrupt and pick up the slack periodically, and I've learned to really appreciate Aladdis Nez for what it is. It's more than competent in its platforming. It's often inventive, or at the very least interesting, in what it makes players do. It's challenging without being obscenely hard, and there's no denying it nails the atmosphere and setting of the Disney film it's based on. Snaladin is genuinely a good game, and easily one of the best movie tie-ins on the console. Colour me green. I mean, uh, surprised, sorry. With a gun to my head before doing this list, I would never in a million years have said a game based on the mask could ever be good. And I certainly wouldn't have accepted a reality in which it only narrowly misses out on a coveted top 5 slot in my own personal ranking of SNES movie games. Shows how far classic and curious cynicism gets you, really. Yeah, so the mask is frustratingly difficult, where I've heard that before, and it's clunky in the controls department at times. It is 
lacking in areas. But there's a clear knowledge and appreciation for the source material that shines through and leads to a game that's so much more than you would expect from a movie tie-in. The presentation is bang on. The elements of exploration and secret hunting brings a bit of excitement to what could otherwise have been a right-to-left jumpy-jumpy slog. The mix of mask powers add a sprinkle of sweetness to the mix and give it another extra leg up over the competition. And a few other bits and pieces all come together to conspire in a positive fashion. The mask works. It's fun. It's a good example of what can be done with a game based on a film, and even if, like everything else here, it can hardly compete with non-movie-based genre royalty, in this little bubble of existence, it's a winner. Platformer the Jungle Book manages to stand high on this particular hill of movie games by way of it hitting a few of the bare necessities. It's nice to look at, it almost makes sense thematically, and it actually controls really well. Seeing a huge number of titles that came earlier in this list, you probably won't be surprised to hear that simply controlling well isn't a given, so that is a huge boost to Mowgli's SNES adventure. It falls into some traps, of course, in that it's a wee bit simplistic and way harder than it really should be, yet another one to wang infinite lives on and enjoy the learn the absolutely precise patterns ride. Plus, it's another slightly weird one in that it came out approximately 2.3 million years after the film it's based on. But given I was a kid when this came out, and I loved the film independently of the game, I can see the logic in it. So again, again, again for the umpteenth time, it's imperfect, and it doesn't really compete with the big guns of SNES platformers, and really what the hell was it with the 90s and making things this difficult to play? But The Jungle Book is a good platformer, with a great sense of its source material, and just in playing it, its snappy, responsive controls, its interesting levels, its mix of scenarios cribbed from the film and reworked for the game, you quickly realise that it's one of the best movie games in SNES land. Let's ignore any previous mention I might have made of games being rushed to meet the launch of a film because according to some top bod at Traveller's Tales, the studio behind the Toy Story games on console, it was this game that made that approach the norm. And you might also want to ignore anything I might have said previously about games rushed to meet a film's release all being bad because Toy Story… it's good actually. So you've got a, I am shock, straightforward platformer for the most part, with a simple mix of jumping and whipping to get Woody through levels, stop sniggering at the back. But it's mixed in with some smart design, an urge to backtrack and collect all the stars in a level, and best of all, a mix of approaches as you make your way through the game. You've got platforming, car driving, riding on the back of things in, falling with style, even a first person segment. It's creative and interesting and shows real care for the source material. It's a very good filmy game and I had fun playing it, especially with Infinite Lives on because Toy Story's too hard for eight-year-olds. And me. Exciting aside, apparently Nintendo Power gave Toy Story 14.3 out of 20, which is one of the most ridiculous scoring systems I've ever seen. That's not a 20-point scale. That's a 200-point scale. Anyway. If I'm allowing myself things like Jurassic Park 2 and Outlander in this list, I have to allow Scrambled Valkyrie. And I'm happy about that because it's a good game. This one is based on the storyline universe of the movie Macross Do You Remember Love, but it's set after the film so it isn't specifically based on the film in question. So again, if this doesn't do it for you and you are disgusted with my rankings criteria, you may ignore the number three on this list. Scrambled Valkyrie is a shmup that would be pretty standard fare if it were just what you see on loading it up. Well designed, fun bosses to consistently lose against, a punishing one life backed up by limited continue system, three characters with different space bots to pilot and weapons to go with them, power-ups, all that stuff. But what helps the game lift its head a wee bit higher in this whole list is how you're able to switch between three forms with each character, each form having access to different weapons and individual power-ups for each weapon. This leads to a game where you're choosing your character based on their ship bot and the weapons they have, and then incorporating a second layer of strategy to that decision in-game as you prioritise upgrades for your three different weapons as you play, and even try to switch out to a less preferred weapon just before you take a hit, as hits reduce an individual weapon's power rating. Can you tell I like it? 
Scrambled Valkyrie is smart, it's fun, it looks and sounds fantastic, and it's one of the best movie games on SNES. Which makes it a shame it's not directly based on a movie then, really. The first game might have been on the lower end of OK and have adapted the basic approach of a platformer with a few tiny flourishes, but the Adams Family sequel pushed the boat out a fair old bit by looking in another direction for its inspiration, The Legend of Zelda. It's a bold move, because riffing on the greats is a surefire way to get yourself laughed out of SNES Town, but Adams Family Values holds its own when compared to true gaming royalty as it is. No, Fester's adventure isn't as good as Zelda, don't be absurd, but Ocean did a fantastic job on the second Adam's outing all the same, and while I can't exactly say it follows much of what's set up in the movie, aside from the pubert stuff, pubert, it really doesn't matter much in the end. Values is a game that nails the Adam's family feel. The characters are the ones we know from the screen, and the dialogue is what we expect from them. The settings are suitably spooky and ooky, and then, of course, the actual game bits work out pretty bloody well too. There's a lot of adventure to be had, a lot of exploration to explore, a lot of growth to experience, and a lot of a little waddling bald man who shoots electricity out of his hands to enjoy. I'll upend my positivity by saying no, it's not up there with the best SNES games of all time. None of the games on this list are, in case you were still wondering there. But Adam's Family Values is almost, almost the best movie game on SNES. Which just leaves one more. Arnold has a number of entries in this list, and a couple of them are absolute stinkers in the very lowest echelons of SNES movie games. You may remember them from 23 years ago when this video first started playing. But the muscles from, um, Austria is also main character in the best movie game ever made for Nintendo's superest of super consoles. True Lies is a wonderful mix of elements. It's a well-made, fun and captivating top-down shooter. You're blasting bad bastards, of course, but there's a mix of objectives to complete and civilians to avoid putting in harm's way in each mission that raises it above the basic foundations on which the game is built. Mechanically, it's absolutely sound, too. It controls well, you're able to just potter about blasting, fix your direction of fire, do an exciting commando roll, which is different from Arnie's own exciting commando roll, pick up an array of weapons and generally think a bit and strategize a bit your way through the game. It's challenging, but by no means the impossible bullshit so many other games of this era, games of this list, are. And genuinely, I ended up playing it for a good couple of hours in one sitting. I probably would have finished it were it not for having a dog to walk or some chores to stare at and not actually do. Coupled with those actually good gamey elements is the fact that True Lies riffs brilliantly on the film it's based on, with the simple concept of setting a level in a place sort of like what's in the film and going from there. Sure, you're not riding a horse through Washington DC or whatever, nor are there breaks to dance a tango, but it's got that feel bang on, to the point where it accidentally becomes one of the best James Bond games ever made. Just as the film accidentally became one of the best James Bond movies ever made. Plus, let's be real for a second here, in how many games is your sidekick, your backup, your voice of reason played by Tom Arnold? None. Exactly. The Crimson Jihad has never been so much fun. Except for in the film where it's more fun, but really that's unfair because True Lies is an absolute banger of a film and not much else comes close. True Lies the game is absolutely very good, and my pick for the best of the best movie games on SNES. Ah, that was quite long, wasn't it? Let's do a quick roundup of some stats. Most appearances on the list, Ocean Software with 10 games from number 56 all the way up to number 2. Probe had the second most appearances with 6 games. Winning developer Beam Software had 1 on the list, ranked number 1, a decent batting average I'd say. LucasArts had all its 4 titles in the top 20, though they were secondary developers on all those games. Traveller's Tales hit three times, first in 59th position with Bram Stoker's Dracula alongside Psygnosis on dev duties, but then not popping up again until the top 15. The absolute worst movie game developer in all of SNES history isn't Radical Entertainment, with its sole entry being last placed Bebe's Kids. Imagineering Inc. tried to take that crown with three titles, ranking from 45 through to 55, 
But no, the anti-kudos goes to Bit Studios with some absolute turds clogging up four slots in the rear end of the list. No Escape at 53, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein at 61, Terminator 2 Judgment Day at 63, and the one that would be the worst if Bebe's kids didn't exist, Last Action Hero at 65. Good work, all. Thanks, as always, to my patrons on Patreon link below if you want to join them. They bring me as much happiness as Jamie Lee Curtis dropping an Uzi down some stairs and accidentally killing a bunch of terrorists. I'm off to rest my vocal cords after talking for so long and, yeah, probably to watch True Lies again. Absolute banger. Bye.